Steve Arnold and Jeff Notkin are modern-day treasure hunters. They're calling to me. I've got meteorites in my bones. They travel the world in search of meteorites, alien invaders that have been crashing into our planet for the last four and a half billion years. On this quest, Jeff and Steve return to their top-secret alpha site in Kansas, where in 2008, they unearthed a massive meteorite worth approximately $25,000. Now they're back convinced there are even bigger space rocks on a piece of property that until now has been off limits. We're optimistic this parcel of land might contain some significant meteorites. That sounds really good. The hunt is on for huge meteorites packed with valuable extraterrestrial gemstones. We're looking at a half a million dollars in the high quality gemstones. This time they have a secret weapon a meteorite hunting motorcycle built by Orange County Choppers. The bike will lead them to their biggest find ever. It's a monster! Yeah, baby! Success at last. Jeff and Steve have just arrived in eastern Kansas, deep in the heartland of America. The guys are returning to a piece of property they don't want anyone else to know about. Do you remember the first time we came up and it was, I think it was July? Yeah, we like 116, which was like a record. And I remember us saying, we're never gonna come up here in the summer again. <laughs> and now it's almost the same time of year. The guys have given this site the code name Alpha. They're keeping the location a secret because the meteorites here contain something rare and very valuable. The Alpha meteorite is rich in olivine crystals. A few of those are gem quality crystals. If word leaked out regarding where we're finding these rocks, there would be a plague of people to send upon this site, like locusts, really. No! In 2008, they found a 109-pound rock roughly four miles from a piece of property the guys have never been allowed to explore. The new land is toward the big end of the strewn field, where the guys think the large pieces of the meteorite fell. Jeff and Steve are confident they'll find a meteorite two to three times bigger and more valuable at this new site. After years of negotiation, we finally managed to gain access to a choice piece of land, and there's a good chance it will contain spectacular meteorites. When meteorites plummet to Earth, the area where they land is called the strewn field. As it fragments into multiple pieces, typically the small pieces fall first, and the bigger ones go further because they've got more mass and inertia, and it carries them that extra bit of distance. Where we're finding big meteorites that are widely dispersed, that's at the big end, and that's where we are here at Alpha. There aren't many meteorites out here, but if there are any, they're gonna be big. Kansas is considered the cosmic bullseye of America, with more meteorites found per square mile than any other state, which is why it's a popular place to dig for space rocks. Day one of the hunt, Jeff and Steve strategize the best way to cover the most ground in a short amount of time. Using intel from previous finds, they decide to divide the land into five hunt areas based on the likelihood of finding the largest meteorites. Location number one is located in the southwest section of the new search area and the sweet spot of the strewn field. Here's where some pieces have been found. That's where we're at right now. The guys are relying on these previous finds to lead them to the next big meteorite, like clues on a treasure map. I think one of the most important tools in searching for meteorites is a good map. Knowing where you want to look and basing that on intelligence and research. All right, well, we can talk about it all day or we can go find something. There's got to be one more out there waiting for us. Location number one is a field covered with small trees and other obstacles, which forces the guys to hunt slowly on foot using handheld metal detectors. It's time to stop talking about it. It's time to start doing it. I'm using our medium-sized detector. This is the 18-inch coil. This is very good for medium to large targets at a moderate depth. One of the unique aspects of the Alpha site is that the big meteorites found here are buried relatively close to the surface. 12 to 18 inches below the topsoil is a hard and impenetrable layer of bedrock. The length of the Alpha Strunfield, which is many, many miles, tells us 
that the angle of entry was probably not steep. It was probably relatively shallow. It gave the meteoroid more time to burn. Those rocks are breaking up. They're dropping pieces all along. Jeff and Steve believe this shallow trajectory allowed the meteorite to slow down enough to land without damaging the valuable olivine crystals. All right, there's my first target of the day. Sounds pretty close to the surface. It's right about there. Ah, this ground is hard. Our first meteorong of the day, some barbed wire. A meteorong is anything that's not a meteorite, plain and simple. Not what we're looking for. For every meteorite that we discover, we typically unearth 10 or 50 or 100 meteorongs. That comes with the territory. You got to find where they're not to make sure you've really covered all the places that they could be. That sounds kind of encouraging. Nice, strong target. That one sounded close to the surface, but I'm not seeing anything. Oh, wow, this is really interesting. Here's a bit of uh, harness from uh, a horse. It's been in the ground so long that this root's grown through it. That's probably frontier era. Jeff, I found a hatchet. I found a bit of an old bridle. Oh, well, that's cool. We must be on the Santa Fe Trail. Yeah, no doubt. The old Santa Fe Trail crossed this field. In the 1800s, explorers and pioneers used the Santa Fe Trail as the major thoroughfare across the United States. The wagons would break, things would fall out, they'd set up to camp. There's proof that there were people here. <laughs> <laughs> well, whoever dropped that hatchet might have dropped the iron. I guess they just... Put that on the fire till it gets hot. Pull it out. Iron their clothes out with it. That's by far the strongest signal I've gotten out here. That one we're definitely going to dig. When the detector shrieks, there is really something significant down there. Wow, look at that. Meteorite hunters Steve Arnold and Jeff Notkin are hunting space rocks in eastern Kansas, a state that's been hit by over 135 meteorites. They're at their top secret alpha location, where they unearthed a 109 pound find worth about $25,000 in 2008. The guys have returned to alpha, confident they can unearth a huge meteorite on a piece of land they couldn't get permission to hunt until now. The alpha strewn field crosses many different landowners' properties. This particular piece of land was owned by a landowner that I've been trying to contact and get a lease for over three years. It's day one of the hunt. Jeff and Steve have been exploring location number one for almost six hours. Based on their old finds, Jeff and Steve suspect the bigger rocks from the fall flew farther down the strewn field and could have landed here. The distribution of pieces out here in the strewn field actually gives us clues about what happened during the event that created them. And that's one of the reasons we like to carefully map strewn fields and log the location of every find that we make. That's by far the strongest signal I've gotten out here. Well, it was a bigger target. <laughs> wow, look at that. It's an old plow blade. Serve hors d'oeuvres off that. That's quite stylish, really. It's just another in a series of media wrongs, and the guys are starting to get frustrated. For years, they've been sure that this land would produce, and quickly. Both agree to hunt for another 45 minutes. If I don't find something by then, I'm going to probably start hitting things with my pick that aren't the ground. But uh, that's ugly. I don't really want you to have to see that. You getting anything? Oh, just stuff. Yeah, me too. Just a lot of junk. No meteorites. I think we might as well just call it a day. Having hunted this area before, the meteorite men anticipated the need for a versatile all-terrain vehicle to cover the most ground. 
A couple months ago, they asked the guys at Orange County Choppers to build a state-of-the-art meteorite hunting machine for the fields of Alpha. I think it's going to end up being the meteorite men's secret weapon. Just prior to the hunt, Jeff and Steve visited OCC to check on the bike's progress. Is this really our bike? This is it. It's the beginning of it. Pretty cool looking on. Is this really oh, your uh, equipment? <laughs> this is this is our stuff. Uh, Holy oh, mackerel. So that's what we're out looking for. Heavy it's metal. Almost as heavy as the bike. That's heavy, man. <laughs> <laughs> the material, it wasn't really what I expected. It's, it's almost like a piece of steel. One of our missions today was to bring in all of our equipment, our metal detectors, rock hammers, our laptops, GPS, all the gear that we travel with in the field to discuss with the designers how they're going to fit on the bike. How big of a meteorite will that be able to hoist out of a hole? About the it, size of a car. It'll probably be a, uh, between yeah. either well, one or two ton Wow. Winch. Okay. Well, the idea with the winch is it's strong enough so you can drag this thing backwards when you get it stuck. Oh. This bike is definitely going to be an asset. It's going to take us some places where we could not get any other vehicle, no doubt about it. Day two. After failing at location number one, the guys regroup at a local cafe to see if they can agree on a new plan of attack. It's rare when these two agree on anything. Steve's conservative. He is very liberal. Jeff's a neat freak. Some would say I'm sloppy. Hungry? Yeah. I am a vegetarian, but he'll eat any kind of meat that exists on the face of the earth. I like an egg, and can I get bacon and sausage? And I'd like the omelet, please but no meat. The guys also don't see eye to eye when it comes to what they would do if they find a big rocket alpha. You're breaking them down? Well, um, it's kind of an acid that I use. You're putting my meteorites in acid. Steve is known to submerge alpha meteorites in an acid bath to extract the valuable crystals inside. The stones found at Alpha are incredibly rare stony iron palisites and are the only type of meteorites that contain olivine crystals that are large enough to be faceted into gemstones and sold for large sums of money. The process of extracting the stones from these space rocks destroys the nickel iron matrix, leaving the crystals from the four and a half billion year old meteorite intact. Steve's really all about the money. I think meteorites are luminous visitors from outer space, and they should be admired and preserved and protected. Depending on size and weight, a one-carat high-quality extraterrestrial gemstone is worth up to $5,000, slightly less than a quality diamond, but a lot more rare. Y you, you treat them as, as if these are animate objects, like they're alive, and that putting them in acid's hurting them or something but they've traveled such a long way to be here. Don't you think it's a little bit disrespectful to take a beautiful thing like this and put it in a tub of acid just to get gemstones out of it? Jeff wants to keep every meteorite intact. He doesn't even hardly want to wipe the dirt off of them. My attitude is, hey, let's make the money on it. Um, he's a purist. I'm a realist. You know, worst case is we find a beautiful meteorite. I hit Steve over the head with a shovel and leave him in the hole from which the meteorite came. One, it's bacon. The guys struck out at location number one. They have high hopes for location number two. It's another area they've never hunted, and it's close to one of their bigger finds. Oh, man. But there's a problem. Steve arranged to have the hay harvested so it would be clear for hunting, but the farmer cut the wrong field. The guys are out of luck. If there is a monster meteorite at location number two, they won't be finding it today. Well, it looks like you just started today. And I don't know how long it takes it. Well, probably a long time. By yeah. the time he gets to this, we'll probably be gone. Yeah. Jeff and Steve are left with no choice but to head off to their next pasture of opportunity. Location number three is north of number two, with lots of different types of terrain. The guys are going to try a new tool, hoping the big rocks flew past the first two locations and landed here. I got three detectors to build. Horatia. Yeah, but I've got three things to put together. You've only got one. Because alpha meteorites contain a high concentration of iron, metal detectors are the ideal tools to hunt this buried treasure. The first metal detector was invented by Alexander Graham Bell in 1881. 
It was used as a medical device to find the fatal bullet lodged in President James Garfield's body. Metal detectors today are more sophisticated, but operate the same way. A signal is broadcast as an electromagnetic field. When that signal encounters a metallic object, there's a change in frequency. Over the years, Steve and Jeff have built an assortment of metal detectors. They've got all shapes and sizes, and can pick and choose which ones to use, depending on the hunt terrain. This is the uh, giant 18-foot wide coil, and it's uh, too big to handle by hand, so uh, we've evolved over the time uh, from a cart with wheels to, to now we're on to a sled. We can't have any metal, and so we're subject to PVC pipe, glue, zip ties, and uh, duct tape. Doesn't it remind you of the mad scientist tinkering <laughs> in his laboratory? It's a working. This is the new Gemini 3. It's a new design. The principle is both of these bits are, in effect, small metal detector coils. So the idea is we suspend them on this strut, and you walk through your target area. The control box sends a signal, a radio frequency, down into the ground and it's picked up by the second box. Because the two boxes are separated, it gives us quite a big search area. And the part that excites me the most is you can use it in any terrain. So it's uh, one of the latest weapons in our arsenal. So we're going to try calibrating it now. Any kind of mineralization in the soil will affect the detector. So I need to calibrate it so that it's familiar with the terrain in which it's, it's working. Transmitter's on. Receiver's on. That's not going to work. You did read the manual, didn't you? Yeah. OK. For the record, I haven't touched that. No, you haven't. You don't have any metal on you, do you? Ooh. Well, this thing's just not calibrating. Well, I'm going to take the truck, and you keep working on that a little bit. Ooh. So Jeff's back there trying to figure out how to get this two-box thing working. It is essential for what we've got going on this part of the hunt. We need to be able to hunt with it in areas that there's just no way this machine can get to. The massive metal detector sends out an electromagnetic pulse through almost 30 feet of cable, which is connected to a receiver box Steve carries in the cab of the truck. It's like mowing a lawn with a metal detector. If he hears a signal, he'll stop and investigate further with a handheld device. While Steve starts to comb location That's number three, really Jeff is in calibration hell. Well, I'm really not having any luck getting this uh, unit working. I mean, it's a pretty sophisticated piece of equipment. I think it's just that I'm not up to speed in how to use it. I'm very frustrated right now. It's about 100 degrees out here, and I'd like to be hunting. Meanwhile, Steve has a problem of his own. Look at this. Crazy. They're circling me. Get out of here. Ah, dang, it. Hey, don't eat that rope. Yeah. Yeah, get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go. Go. Go play somewhere else. Let's go. Come on, I'll take you. Come on. The landowner leases this ground to a rancher that keeps cattle out here, but he's also leasing it to me to hunt meteorites. And every once in a while, our two interests cross paths. Find anything yet? I found a truck. Oh, did you? Jeff finally gets the two box calibrated. I think this is going to work great on really big targets. So you want to hop in? Sure. He hitches a ride with Steve to an area where he can put the detector to use. Just when things are looking up, another problem. Oh, man. The rope broke. <sighs> As frustration mounts once again, help is spotted on the horizon. Jeff Notkin and Steve Arnold repaired the rope on their giant 18-foot metal detector sled and are back on the hunt for meteorites in Kansas. They've been exploring location number three, but unsuccessfully. 
With just a few hours until Paul Sr. delivers their new meteorite hunting motorcycle, the guys decide to check out one more area, location number four. We're optimistic that this parcel of land might contain some significant meteorites. Hey, Steve, thanks for leaving all your trash in the back of the truck. It's very nice. Oh, I'm sorry. Next time, I'll litter. To cover as much ground as possible, Jeff and Steve split up. This site we're, we're at now, it's still towards the big end of the strewn field. I mean, I think if there's anything here, we could expect to find meteorites that weigh between 50 and 100 pounds. With a deep-seeking two-box detector finally calibrated, Jeff uses it to comb the area. When he gets a signal, he uses one of the handheld detectors to pinpoint the exact spot to dig. So there's something in there. Uh, this one's tricky. Oh. No wonder. Old nails. After three hours in the hot sun at location number four, Jeff and Steve see the one piece of equipment that could change the game. There it is. It's there. orange. <laughs> it really stands out well against the field. Here comes this majestic orange vehicle looking like a chariot rocketing down the dirt road with Paul Sr. on it. It was a sight well, I will never forget. Field. There's yeah. not going to be any missing it. No way. Woo! Check it out. That is a chunk of a machine. It's wide, it's solid, it's orange. It's a Look mean machine. Wow! Heavy metal! You've outdone yourself. I don't think they expected the bike to look the way it did. Man, there's so much going on. I tell you what, this year, GPS is probably one of the biggest things. We've got this GPS unit mounted right in between the handlebars where we want it. We're going to be able to track where we're going, and more importantly, we're going to be able to tell where we've been. Once that winch goes on the front or the back, in the these back. are Baja lights that you got here, three with the guards on them. We usually go over the top a little bit, and we do uh, custom bikes. They want something where they can go on a uh, more of a rough terrain and also be able to carry the equipment. It's sort of like watching a really proud parent talk about his child. He showed us every little gadget. Oh, Check yeah, the gas cap. Right. got a uh, gas cap. The OCC staff took one of our actual meteorites, made a cast out of it, and used that for the gas tank cover. It ah, looks and feels like a real meteorite. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> I think you got it all going on here. Why don't you take it for a little ride? I was just a little bit taken aback by how powerful it was and how heavy it is. Whoa. It's not a little lightweight dirt bike like I'm used to driving. This is heavy metal. It's got this throaty engine that just goes. This bike is definitely going to help us find more meteorites. No question about it. We're burning daylight. It's time to get out there and start doing what we do, which is digging for space rocks. All right, well, I guess I'm going to let you drive it now. Right. But I want you to remember some things that have happened in the past with you and heavy equipment. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. Oops. <laughs> the guys take off to hook up the 18-foot coil and head back out into location number four. With the addition of their new bike, They've got everything they need to find the big meteorites. Oh, Steve, this would make a good didgeridoo, I bet. A didgeridoo? We could use that in Australia. I'll probably blend right in. Yeah, you'd blend right in. OK, off into the sunset, as it were. Yeah. Reinvigorated, the guys start to grid what's left of location number four's bumpy terrain. Yikes. Don't go over the trees. Then, 20 minutes into the ride, oh, stop, 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 stop. they get a very promising hit. You found one already? Mm. 
Just a few minutes into hunting on their new gadget-packed motorcycle, Jeff and Steve get a major hit from their 18-foot coil. We're driving. Hit a beep. Whoa, stop, 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 stop. It was uh, a, a nice little pop. Knew there was something metal. Barb wire. Got a meteor wrong, but hey, at least it's working. And uh, compared to everything else that's been going on, I'm, I'm, this is, this is, a, this is good. This is better. Maybe we can find a meter at tomorrow, though. Day three of the hunt. Before heading to Alpha, Jeff and Steve video conference with expert gemologist Charles Elias. I had sent you up a, a batch of the crystals that, that had been harvested out of one of the previous meteorites. The crystals are olivine, named for their green color and commonly found on Earth. In gem form, they're called peridot. Until recently, we only thought of peridot gems as originating from Earth. But in recent years, Steve and myself have faceted gem quality olivine crystals extracted from palisite meteorites. And so we now have, for the first time, extraterrestrial peridot available on Earth. Depending on the market, peridot found on Earth goes for about $60 a carat. The extraterrestrial peridot sells for up to $5,000 a carat. All of these gems are being precision cut like a diamond would be cut, which makes them also very unique. Take a look at this, the largest ever extraterrestrial faceted area. Wow. And this stone has a value of right around $25,000. Wow. These expeditions are expensive, and they've got to be funded. My issue is, if we find something new and amazing here, I don't want to see him then go dump in a vat of acid while I stand there and go, ah! Jeff wants to preserve any potential alpha finds, while Steve wants to melt them down in acid for the valuable gemstones locked inside. There's no way Jeff is going to be able to win an argument with me when, when, when one or two gemstones are worth more than the whole rock. Jeff and Steve can argue values all day long, but first they have to find something. So it's back to the strewn field and location number five, a huge area that is perfect to test the bike and its high-tech GPS mapping system. All their hopes now rest on their new toys. The Trimble Tractor GPS allows us to see exactly where we are on a visual readout, but it also paints a yellow swath across the green background. The yellow represents the parts that we've covered. Almost 90 minutes into the gridding of location number five, the guys get a big hit near a fence line. Oh, hey. Right there. You got something? Something strong. Something strong. This field is full of meteor wrongs. We're driving along, we get a signal. It's like, OK, is it a meteorite or isn't it? Because we don't know. This is the strong, good bell curve. Like we like it. Really? Yeah. It's awfully close to the fence, though. You know, that usually means a big pile of barbed wire buried underground. Oh, shut up. Right in here. That sounds really good. <laughs> Starting to pick it up right there. Right there. That's a big one, Jeff. Wow. I want to see if the F-75 picks it up. When we get a really good target, I try not to get too excited about it, because when you dig down, and then it's just a pipe or a plow blade, it's pretty disappointing. Don't damage my rock hammer. Where the guys are digging now is about a mile north of where they found the 109-pound meteorite. By their calculations, this is exactly where a bigger rock could have landed. I said it seems to be taking up a lot of the area, but I'd say we're right on the money. This ground is so dense. But the good news is, once we start getting down into the really densely packed soil, it's less likely to be a man-made object. The deeper we go, the better it looks. Anything that's man-made is usually going to be pretty close to the top. As evidenced by the meteor wrongs that we've 
already dug up on this expedition. They were all pretty shallow within three or four inches, would yeah. you say? Oh, yeah, or on top. Oh! I heard something. Oh, that sounds very solid. Jeff, I think we've got a monster on our hands. Day four of the alpha hunt in Kansas. As the guys continued gritting at location number five, their detectors started to wail along a fence line. Oh, that sounds very solid. The sound of that metal of the shovel against the metal on the target. <laughs> There's not a sweeter sound around. Look at that. Got a magnet? Yes, I do. Meteorites are composed of olivine and metallic iron. If a magnet sticks to the rock they just uncovered, chances are Jeff and Steve have struck meteorite gold. And all of a sudden, the heart starts racing, and, and you see that little knob sticking up, and it's just got that distinct look. <laughs> oh, that looks very promising. We knew it was a meteorite right away. Do I see crystals glinting in the sunlight there? The meteorites from this strewn field are palisites, and they're packed full of olivine crystals. So the glinting in the sunlight is also looking very encouraging. I'm trying not to get too excited yet, but oh, there I'm feeling something hard down there as well. Yeah, yeah, that's looking very much like a meteorite at the moment. The really exciting thing about these meteorites is they're unlike any others ever found on Earth. It's one of the rarest of the rare. What separates the alpha meteorites from other palisites found around the world is the pristine quality of the olivine crystals within. In most palisites, the crystals shatter upon impact with an asteroid. For reasons no one can figure out, the rocks found at Alpha survived their journey with the crystals largely intact, which makes them perfect for faceting into pricey pieces of jewelry. The largest one we found when Jeff and I were here together last was 109 pounds. And so this is downstream a little ways, so we're expecting it to possibly be bigger. Jeff and Steve suspect this meteorite is going to be larger because of where it is in the strewn field. Meteoroids can come in from any direction, but the laws of physics will tend to have the smaller ones drop off first and the larger ones carry on farther. So we use the terminology downstream. That's big. Seriously? That's over a foot down. Jeff, I think we've got a monster on our hands. Yeah, look at the size of that. Ah! This is the biggest thing we've found in some long time. Oh, we've got most of the mud away from the sides now. Hey, we got a winch on this thing. But the winch is on the front and the bike doesn't go in reverse. But I think the winch will go, I think it switches to the back. Really? That winch goes on front or the back. Oh, nice. The guys reconfigure the winch. Is that gonna be enough? But doubt it's strong enough to pull the iron rock no. out of the ground, where scientists no. believe it's been entombed for several thousand years. Will the motorcycle move the meteorite? Well, I'm gonna go as slowly as I possibly can. Oh! <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, that motorcycle's a powerful machine, and, and this demonstrates how that rock is really sucked into the ground. Amazing, you lost your hat. Oh, no wonder we off. couldn't lift it up. <laughs> oh, it's huge. It's this, a monster! It officially! Is a monster. This has got to be one of the biggest alpha stones ever found. Yeah. It's easily over 200 pounds, right? I would bet it's 250. It's kind of a profound moment. I'm, I'm interacting with the mechanics of the universe here, the processes that 
that brought this rock to Earth and kept it buried there for thousands of years are grand and mysterious. And so in that moment, there's nothing else in my life that, that compares to that. I can't really explain exactly to someone what it's like to uncover one of these visitors, but it's mystical and it's great. One, two, three, go. <laughs> If Jeff had his way, all of these rocks would end up in his collection, but there's no question in my mind, this rock is going to be made into gemstones. Success! <laughs> Jeff and Steve are still at odds over what to do with the gemstones inside this newest find. To get a better look at what they've got, they head to a local car wash. We're really keen to get the mud off and see what it actually looks like. This is when we find out whether or not it's rich in the olivine crystals. I feel like Ghostbusters. OK, here we go. This happens once out of many, many expeditions. We may never find a rock that big again for the rest of our lives. So today's a triumph. Wow. <laughs> Look at these. Beautiful color. One of the most fantastic moments is, is when we actually clean it off and get to see it in, in all its beauty, and it's better than you expected. Oh, look at all the olivine in here. Wow. It's loaded with crystals. Do we want to wax it? <laughs> it's difficult to assess the value of, of one of these alpha palisites. Palisites are rare. They're very valuable. They're highly desired by collectors. Look at that one right there. Look at that big crystal sticking That's out. That's amazing. But for Steve, the value of this meteorite lies with the crystals inside. If there's one carat of gemstones for every pound, that's 200 carats. At $5,000 a carat, that's a million dollar rock. This looks like there's a crack yeah. where rust has started on the inside and it's working its way out. Here's one down here too. And so uh, I think it's terminal. Oh, that's your opinion. We'll see. Now that the space rock is clean, the guys are eager to find out its actual weight. They suspect it's a lot bigger and worth a lot more than their 109-pound find. Its weight will be a major factor in determining whether to dissolve it for gems or leave it in its original condition. We're here at the local grain elevator trying to determine how much this rock weighs. We want to know how much this thing's worth. This is the way we find out. Kind of a quiet place here. So and then when you get a meteorite coming in, probably the strangest thing that's happened all year here. Well, it's over 100. Just a normal rock, it looks like to me. It's a little bit heavier. Kind of cool to see that these are in the ground all around here. If Steve and Jeff are right, and this rock weighs more than 200 pounds, it'll be the biggest meteorite they've ever unearthed together at Alpha. Oh, my god. Deep in Kansas, Jeff and Steve have unearthed a massive meteorite buried in a cow pasture. Yay! It is the find of a lifetime. The rock is a rare stony iron palisite filled with gem-quality olivine crystals. So let's just set her up there. Jeff and Steve have estimated its weight at around 200 pounds, which is double the size of the $25,000 meteorite they found in 2008. If their new find is over 200 pounds, it could be worth more than $50,000. We want to know how much this thing's worth. This is the way we find out. Two Final weight is 223 pounds, making this not only the largest alpha stone that Steve and I have ever found, but it's almost exactly double the weight of the next largest one that we found. 109 pounds, our previous record, 223 pounds, this one. It's pretty fantastic. That's a lot of space rock. Big old rock. <laughs> because Steve noticed some rust and a few cracks on the meteorite, he's ready to harvest the space rock for its gemstones. Jeff still wants to preserve it. I'm pretty confident we've got at least 100 carats. At $5,000 a carat, that's a half a million dollars in the high quality, and then we got the medium and lower quality. This is pretty easily a $1 million rock. The guys transport the rock to the Arizona State University lab for analysis. ASU has the largest meteorite collection of any school in the United States. We're looking at a slice of the alpha meteorite. 
Ah, this is interesting. Beginning to see rust. Rust is an indication that the meteorite is rapidly deteriorating. The sample really has disintegrated. And, uh, you know, you can see that it's just falling apart. So there's really, once you broke it. I didn't, nature did. These meteorites tumble through space for billions of years. But once they hit the Earth, the moisture and oxygen in the atmosphere begin an unyielding assault on the iron in the rock, which will eventually destroy it. The guys estimate that one out of a hundred crystals are facetable gemstone quality, but there's no guarantee, and dissolving the rock could leave them with nothing. The meteorite as a whole is worth about $50,000. Jeff and Steve have two options. They can mine the meteorite's valuable olivine crystals or try to preserve it as it is. This one is special. It should be on a pedestal in a museum where people can enjoy it for generations to come. Get those crystals freed up. The choice juicy ones are going to get faceted. They're going to be put in jewelry. And people all over the world are going to enjoy this rock for decades to come. Before making a final decision, Jeff and Steve agree to test the special acid solution on a smaller piece of another alpha meteorite they found three years ago. So we've got the acid working on the meteorite, speeding up what nature is going to do anyway. The meteorite will soak in the acid for two weeks. Five days in, the test meteorite is almost a third of its original size. As the olivine crystals fall off the rock, they're scooped out of the tank. These are pretty nasty when they come out of here, but then we get them all cleaned up and wash them and neutralize the acid that's on them. A week into the process, and already hundreds of the little green crystals have been collected. The alpha meteorite is really one of the most beautiful palisites. When it's cut and polished, it displays a fabulous assortment of crystals of all shapes, sizes, and colors. That one looks pretty clean. There's no question in my mind this rock is going to be made into gemstones. It's got the most beautiful gemstones in the world in it. It's in a matrix of iron that rusts away like a cancer. After a lengthy debate on the future of the meteorite, Jeff and Steve come to an agreement. We will not do anything destructive to the rock for one year. During that time, we're going to try and find a buyer or a museum or university that's interested in acquiring the stone. And Steve agreed that if we can find someone who will pay a fair price for it, we will consider taking that course of action. For now, the guys have a $50,000 alpha rock. But someday in the future, the rock they pulled from a field in Kansas could yield them up to $1 million. These gemstones came from outer space between Mars and Jupiter, formed four and a half billion years ago. What it took for these to form and what it took to get these to this field is just unbelievable. Most people alive on the planet today will never find a meteorite. They're so rare. In that moment when, when you uncover the first part and you stick the magnet on and then you just know in your heart that it's, it's real, it's really from outer space. We got one. Pretty sweet. Today's been a winner. This will uh, live on for my memory for, well, for light years. <laughs>